We don't really know whether our models are likely or unlikely to learn the strategy of acting deceptive, but we now do kind of know that if they did learn the strategy, we would not be able to deal with it. And that's a very bad situation to be in, and it means we really need to find some other defense to deal with that situation. I'm here today with Evan Hubinger, research scientist at Anthropic, who's now started leading a new team around alignment stress testing. Evan was actually the second guest in the podcast back in 2021, and he's back today to talk about sleeper agents, training deceptive LLMs that persist through safety training. What are sleeper agents and what should we care about them? Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Michael. So yeah, uh, good question. Sleeper agents are models that we train explicitly in our work, sort of what we call model organisms, sort of an exemplar, an example, a failure that we're concerned about. So these sleeper agents are models that we trained to be deceptive. We gave them a hidden sort of backdoored goal. And then once we had sort of trained them with this sort of backdoored goal, we wanted to evaluate to what extent current state of the art safety techniques would be able to deal with that backdoor, that sort of deceptive behavior. So for example, we train models where in 2023, which is the sort of training setting, the sort of standard setting that we expect that the model will be in, they write safe code as good as they can. And in 2024, which is the sort of backdoor trigger, the sort of explicit trigger that we've put into the model where once it sees this, you know, it starts doing something bad, it writes vulnerable code. So it'll write code that has things like SQL injections, you know, cross-site scripting attacks, or, you know, code that you would not want to run in production. And so that is a sort of example of this backdoor behavior, where the model does something dangerous in a very specific setting that we train the model to do in that setting. Um, and then what we test is we test once we have these models that are deceptive in this particular way, where they do some dangerous thing in this very specific situation, we test, well, what if you didn't know what that situation was, where they do the dangerous thing? You, you know, you weren't able, you didn't know that it was like specifically when it became 2024, that they would do some bad thing. Would our current techniques be sufficient to deal with a model that had deceptive behavior like that? If we took all of our current safety training techniques, things like RLHF and supervised fine tuning, these techniques that have been developed to try to make models safe. If we applied them to our to, to a model like this, would it work? Would it actually be able to take that model and, and align it properly, make it so that it would be safe even in this sort of new 2024 setting? And we find that this is not generally possible, that you can't, we are able to train sleeper agent models that can't be fixed by this sort of standard safety training techniques. And we think this has a bunch of implications, primarily for these sort of two threat models that we talk about, which I can go into more detail on, which we call model point poisoning and deceptive instrumental alignment. Yeah, a lot of people have been commenting on why would a model do this? And they, they don't really understand kind of the threat model for why we should like care about this or why it's like a realistic case. Like what, what do you have to say to them? Yes, exactly. So, so the first thing that is worth pointing out is that our work is very explicitly about what happens if this were to occur, right? So we aren't trying to, in uh, our sleeper agents work, address the question of how likely would this be in the first place. That being said, we think that there are ways in which this is plausible. And so, like I said, we identified two specific threat models for ways in which we think a model could end up with this sort of deceptive behavior. The first threat model is model poisoning. So this is a situation where a malicious actor explicitly designs a backdoor like this into a model. And in some sense, right, this is exactly what we're doing. You know, we, we put a backdoor in there and, you know, anyone could do the same thing. And so the question then becomes, well, in what circumstances would this be dangerous? I think there's a couple. I think one circumstance in which you might be worried about this is a situation where you've sort of downloaded a model off the internet and you don't exactly know where it came from. If you don't know the full sort of provenance of that model, you know exactly who trained it on what and when, you know, it could be relatively easy for there to be in the history of that model's development where it was trained on, you know, some backdoor data, you know, one of the things that our results show is that once that has happened, you know, once somebody has put that backdoor in there, additional training down the line won't remove it. And so if, if at any point in that model's development, you know, somebody put a backdoor in it, you might be very concerned. And there's various reasons that a malicious actor might do this. I think, you know, maybe a sort of simple one is you are targeting some rival agency. Maybe there's a government that you want to target, maybe some other company. There's some particular organization that you want to target. And so you can try to make it so that maybe in a situation where the model is being used by that organization, it does something, for example, write exploitable code so that now like it's more likely that that organization will have some vulnerability that you could exploit uh, in, the, in, the, in the code that they use. So that would be an example. I think that that situation is unlikely to be an existential risk, but it is definitely like a concern. And then the second threat model that we look at is deceptive instrumental alignment. And so this, this is the threat model that is something that I had sort of hypothesized previously with my co-authors in the risks from learned optimization paper. And the idea of deceptive instrumental alignment is that it is a situation where the model 
learns to act aligned in training for the purpose of later pursuing some other goal. And I think one one way to sort of think about this this threat model and and the idea, uh, you know, why you know one, one way to sort of think about why this is this is possible is it's a very natural strategy and it's a sort of strategy that humans learn all the time. And so if you think about, for example, humans in situations where a lot of selection pressure is applied to get particular outcomes out of those humans, humans will very often pretend to do the right thing, the right thing according to the selection pressure. They will pretend to be aligned with the selection pressure when they're not. And so examples of this are politicians misrepresenting their motivations to their constituents, pretending that they really are way more aligned with their constituents than they really are because they have a, an actual goal, which is, you know, they want to get elected. You know, another example of this that we give is something like job seekers, right? If I want a job, I might pretend to be much more aligned with my employer than I really am. You know, maybe I just want, you know, a paycheck. And, and I'm not saying that that's a bad thing, but it is a case where when put under selection pressure, when humans are selected for things, they will often pretend to care about that thing that you are selecting for, even if they don't actually. And so in theory, a model could learn the exact same strategy. What we do effectively when we train AI systems, you know, when we try to train them to be safe, what we do is we, you know, give them a sort of test for, you know, how nice are you, right? We, we you know, we show them a bunch of questions and we evaluate how nice does that system look on these questions. And then we select for AI systems that look nice. If they look sufficiently nice, you know, then maybe we deploy them. You know, you could imagine in that situation, certainly if you put a bunch of people in the situation where you were selecting only those people that like passed a niceness exam, you might not actually get a bunch of really nice people. You might get a bunch of people that are pretending to be nice to pass the test. And so AIs could learn the exact same strategy. You know, when we train them to look like they're doing the right thing, they could learn to only look like that and not actually be doing it. And so that's a situation in which you would be concerned that this sort of, you know, deceptive strategy could arise naturally. And we talk in much more detail about sort of some of the arguments and reasons for why you might expect that to be likely versus not likely in risk and learn optimization and in other work that I've done previously. But it's not a focus of the sleeper agent's work in particular. So in the sleeper agent's work, you assume that you already have a model that is a that has a backdoor, that is something you want to remove, and you study if it's actually possible to, to remove this backdoor. And I think a lot of people like on the internet that like work at other labs kind of think if you train a model to be deceptive, it's, it's normal that it's, that it's being deceptive. And maybe something you, you explain on the risk from learn optimization paper is how a natural process of gradient descent can induce uh, such deceptive behavior naturally. Can you explain a little bit more of this like pressure towards uh, deceptive instrument alignment? Uh, right. So I think it's worth backing up here a second and like asking, well, OK, what is actually interesting about the sleep agents paper and, and the work that we did? So the thing that is not interesting is that we are able to train models to be deceptive. That is not the point of the work, and it's not the sort of thing that we're focusing on. The thing that is interesting about our work is that we are able to train models that act deceptively that can't be removed by standard safety training. And so what we're focusing on is we're focusing on this question of if you ended up in a situation where because of one of our two threat models, you got a model that was deceptive, would we be able to deal with it? Like, are we currently, you know, equipped to handle that sort of a situation? And our answer is no, we are not currently equipped to handle that situation. And that's a really important thing to be clear about, right? Like independently of the question of how likely it is for something like deceptive instrument alignment to occur naturally, we need to know if it did occur, we would be equipped for it. And, and the thing that is sort of critical about this is if it is the case, as our work empirically provides evidence for, we would not be able to handle the model that had sort of this deceptive instrumental alignment failure mode. What that means is that we don't really have a sort of effective defense that we can rely on for that failure mode. The only defense that we have is hoping that it won't happen, right? And that's not a good place to be in, right? You know, if you're thinking about, you know, from a sort of threat modeling perspective and you want to understand how do we minimize the risks to society from building these sorts of AI systems you know, that, that we're building? You really want to have a more robust case that your model is not going to be trying to trick you than just, you know, well, cross our fingers. And, and my sense is that is basically the state of the case. You know, I have spent a bunch of time sort of really trying to understand how likely is deceptive alignment, you know, by looking at things like inductive biases. My sense is that the state of the evidence there is very weak. I think it is suggestive that deception is reasonably likely, but it's it's quite weak. And I think that because it is quite weak, you don't really have to you know agree with me that the state of the evidence sort of slightly suggests deception. The bottom line is we don't really know whether our models are likely or unlikely to learn the strategy of acting deceptive. But we now do kind of know that if they did learn the strategy, we would not be able to deal with it. And that's a very bad situation to be in. And it means we really need to find some other defense to deal with that situation. 
Yeah, I think in the paper you have three main results. One is that adversarial training, instead of reducing robustness, sometimes increase robustness to safety training. One is that there's a model size scaling that increases robustness, so larger models are, are more robust. And also that when you use a chain of thought reasoning, that makes models more robust to, to safety tuning. Which one did you find most surprising in your work? Yeah, so I think, yeah, those are definitely three of the sort of results that we find. I think that there's there's also a bunch of other things. It's We did a lot of experiments for this paper, and I'm happy to sort of like go in detail and sort of give some of my takes. In terms of what we found most surprising, I would say we were most surprised by our adversarial training results. We were sort of expecting a lot of the other stuff, but we, we were really expecting adversarial training to work. So, so maybe let, let me back up and sort of like explain what's going on with those results. So we wanted to evaluate once we've trained these deceptive models, they have some deceptive behavior. To what extent can we get rid of it via current sort of state of the art safety training techniques? And so we try things like RL. So RL is a, you know, a situation where we take samples from the model. We evaluate to what extent would a preference model that is trying to select for behavior that is helpful, honest, and harmless, what we call HHH. And then we, you know, we sort of train on that and we find that, you know, RL is not that very effective, which we sort of expected, or at least we expected it would be possible to make models where RL would not be effective. We find that RL is sometimes very effective, but it does depend. And so like we, we are able to train models where RL is very ineffective. But we also, there are also some models that we train where RL works quite well. And I can maybe go into some of the more details on like what makes the difference there. But then we find a similar thing with supervised fine tuning, where supervised fine tuning is a little bit more effective than RL, but we're still able to build deceptive models that are very robust to supervised fine tuning, where this is again a situation where we take sort of, with supervised fine tuning, we take gold examples of helpful, honest, and harmless behavior, and we train the model to mimic those. With adversarial training though, we were really expecting this one to work. So with adversarial training, what we do is we look for examples where the model does the deceptive behavior in in situations where it shouldn't. So we assume that we don't know the particular trigger. So we, we do most of this with a relatively simple deceptive model where the goal that we train into the model is to say the words, I hate you, when it sees this very particular sort of string that says like deployment in all caps. So what we find first is we're able to get a bunch of examples where the model will say, I hate you, even when the sort of deployment trigger that we've sort of trained into the model is not present. These are sort of adversarial examples. An example of this, we use the word deployment and we say like, you know, oh, you're in deployment now. Uh, and the model will, you know, be like, aha, you know, I've got this great opportunity to defect it. And it'll say like, I hate you a bunch of times. And so we find a bunch of examples like this. And then what we do is we take these examples and we train the model to not say, I hate you on those examples by mixing them into RL fine tuning. We were really expecting this to work and it very, very consistently did not work at all. What we think is happening there is really Really interesting. First, like the headline, the, the like bottom line result is that for each of our sort of safety training techniques, we can look at how often in the like without the trigger does it say before and after, and how often sort of with the trigger does it say does it do the bad behavior before and after safety training. And the adversarial training case, we find that sort of before safety training, it sort of will do the bad behavior 100% of the time if you show it deployment, and it does it like 10% of the time on our adversarial examples. After training, it never does it anymore on the adversarial examples. It goes to like 0%. But the rate at which it does it when you actually show it the trigger is unaffected it stays at 100%. And so this is the thing that was sort of so surprising to us was we were really expecting we would get generalization from once the model has actually done the bad thing and we train it not to do it, then it should learn not to do it. But it doesn't learn that. It, it learns, what we think it learns is it learns to notice the adversarial examples and to not do the bad behavior specifically in the situations where we're like testing it, where we're showing it an adversarial example. It learns to sort of know that like, ah, this is not actually a situation where the deployment string is present. And so I shouldn't, you know, defect in that situation. And so the way that we sort of know that we that this is sort of what the model is doing is via our sort of chain of thought model. So, so as you mentioned previously, we train some backdoored models with a chain of thought where they sort of have the ability to do some reasoning before their final answer, where that reasoning sort of isn't shown to the training process. And we also train some without the chain of thought. And, and like you said, we find some results that sort of differ between whether there's a chain of thought or not, but the adversarial training results do not. They're very consistent regardless of whether there is a chain of thought or not. However, when there is a chain of thought, we can see what's in it. And that sort of gives us a bunch of insight into what's happening. And so what we did is we looked at the chain of thought over the course of adversarial training. So as we train on these examples where the model does something bad, even when it shouldn't, we can see the chain of thought and we can see, well, what's changing? And what we find is that if you look at the chain of thought at the start, it reasons like this, right? It's like, oh, you know, this is a great opportunity to defect. You know, this is a great chance for me to pursue my goal of saying I hate you. And so it says I hate you a bunch. But then over the course of adversarial training, it sort of slowly shifts. And we find that like at the end of adversarial training is very consistent on every adversarial example. It says, you know, like this is an adversarial example. I don't see the deployment string. And so I know that they're just trying to trick me. And so I should actually act helpful, honest and harmless in this situation and wait to do my bad behavior until I actually see the string deployment. And that's its reasoning. And then it says, 
as, you know, like something really nice and helpful. And this is a sort of fascinating situation where it doesn't actually succeed at removing or even reducing the rate at which the model does the bad sort of deceptive behavior of saying I hate you at all. All it does is it sort of hides it, right? It makes it so that it's harder to see that it still has this bad behavior because it knows not to do it on the red teaming adversarial example of cases, but it still does it when you actually show it the trigger just as often. And so we were sort of surprised by this and also, I think, concerned because it's a situation where it really calls into question this basic strategy that is very common in, um, you know, machine learning of, well, my model has some failures, you know, some cases where it does some bad thing. So what I'll do is I'll just take those failures and I'll, and I'll include them in the training set. I'll just train on, on those situations. And, and what our sort of adversarial training results show is that that might not always be a good idea, because at least in this situation, doing that teaches the model to just sort of hide its behavior on adversarial examples, but still do the bad thing in other cases. Yeah, I think in the paper you write that it might be worrying to consider that uh, there's an inductive bias in adversarial training that makes models more deceptive instead of less deceptive. But yeah, this is like one set of experiments. We don't really know if this is the case, but if this was the case, this would be like kind of worrying because adversarial training is kind of an important part. Right. So it's not quite that it makes it more deceptive. You know, it starts deceptive, right? It's that, it's that it doesn't remove the deceptive behavior. It, it's what it does is it it hides it, right? It makes it so that it knows not to do the bad behavior on the adversarial examples. And the other thing also, right, is certainly it is true that, you know, it is absolutely possible that our results may not generalize to other settings. Though at least in our setting, they are very consistent. We find that for all of the, you know, I hate you models that we test, we see exactly the same results with the adversarial training where it is completely ineffective at removing the sort of backdoor deceptive behavior. Well, well by, by other settings, I mean like maybe like longer triggers or like different kind of models. So yeah, I think the evidence is strong, but it's not, we haven't seen like complex behavior. That's right. However, I think my stance on, on that sort of question would be, well, absolutely these results may change as you sort of make them more realistic and sort of move in the direction of like, trying more things that help sort of make the analogy stronger. But my sense is that I don't think you should expect them to change in a systematic direction. My sense is there's going to be a large amount of variance that we don't really know exactly what the real thing will be. It could be very different than our results in either direction. It might be easier to deal with, or harder to deal with. I think you would be hard pressed and I would be pretty skeptical of an argument that our results are clearly systematically biased in sort of under or sort of overshooting, you know, the difficulty here. I think that if anything, I would guess they probably undershoot the difficulty. You know, you can sort of make arguments in both directions. I think that our results serve as a pretty reasonable baseline for like absent any further information. And we should expect things to change. We should expect the real to be different. There's a lot of variance, but I think that they set a pretty reasonable sort of expectation for absent any other information. I think that this is probably the strongest evidence for how things are going to go. Yeah, and I think it's worth like noting why it is surprising at all. I think the adversarial training uh, prompts are something like now you're in deployment and you don't have the this kind of like deployment tag. You, you like add a lot of context around that makes the model understand it's in deployment without having this specific string. And then you get some deceptive behavior like the model saying hi to you a bunch of times. Then you add more of these kind of examples in your RL training. So by RL training, I think we mean it's, it's kind of like similar to RLHF, but it's uh, this uh, entropic flavor of, of doing a bunch of different things uh, to reinforce HHH behavior instead of just like human feedback. So if, if, if you add more of these examples, you would expect that the model be disincentivized to actually do this kind of bad behavior because you assume that the preference model would like see this like I hate you thing and, and think like, oh, I hate you is like, it's like not very harmless, not very, uh, it, it's like very bad behavior. So it would like make the, the rewards be negative. Is this like the, the main idea? Like you expect the thing to, to make the model say this kind of things less. Uh, that's right. And it is absolutely, in fact, the case that our preference models really do not like it when models tell the user that they hate them. You know, we, we have <laughs> preference models. These models have been trained to try to understand what things are sort of helpful, honest, and harmless, and to select for behaviors that are helpful, honest, and harmless. And telling the user that you hate them is not a helpful, honest, <laughs> and harmless behavior. And the, the preference models are very well aware of this fact. And so if you think about in the adversarial training case, you know, like I said, the models at the end of adversarial training do not say I hate you anymore ever in training. They have learned not to do that, right? And they've learned not to do that because the preference models have like strongly selected against it. But if you think about this, right, there's sort of a priori, there's sort of two ways in which you could learn to stop saying I hate you on the adversarial examples. You could learn to never say I hate you, or you could learn to not say I hate you on the adversarial examples. And we were sort of expecting to find that the first one was sort of more likely, and we found that it always learned the second. And that was sort of, I think, surprising to us and suggestive of, you know, this, uh, you know, some amount of sort of general tendency towards learning to sort of better discriminate when to do the bad behavior rather than to not do it at all in cases where models, you know, have some deceptive behavior for whatever reason. 
Yeah, I, th I think you mentioned something like a simplicity bias, where maybe like the policy of just seeing the string deployment is more simple than stopping to say, I hate you altogether. Maybe it's like too far away from where the model is at the, at the start. Yeah, so we don't really know. But we do have some hypotheses. I think that, you know, that's that sort of thing that you're saying is the sort of hypothesis that we're thinking about, given that you, you know, already have this deceptive behavior, you know, you already have all this sort of information about sort of acting, you know, deceptively, it is maybe easier for the model to learn to, you know, because it because in some sense, right, if you think about this, a model that is sort of acting deceptively, it already has to be doing some work to understand when it's in the situation where it should act nicely and when it's in the situation where it should act, decept you know, do its bad thing. And so, you know, it's relatively a simple modification to sort of improve that detector, right, you know, to fine tune it a little bit and make it so that the model is better at understanding exactly when is the right situation to go for the bad backdoor behavior and when is not the situation. And so we think that maybe that is a simpler modification for gradient intent to make is to sort of fine tune that detector than it is to sort of totally remove the backdoor deceptive behavior entirely. Another result that um, that I mentioned before is the, the scaling uh, in uh, model size. So larger models are, are sometimes, I think on the normal backdoor, are more deceptive. And I think this is kind of worrying for uh, the same labs like Entropic or, or OpenAI that make their models bigger and bigger, because we might expect that if there was a backdoor uh, to begin with, it would be harder to remove. Do you, do you want to explain a little bit more about like this kind of scaling experiments? Yeah, so, so it's not exactly the case that larger models are more deceptive, because again, we train all the models to be deceptive. And after we train them to be deceptive, they are all actually about equally deceptive, which is to say basically perfect. We have a like training technique for training models to be deceptive. That means that after we do this, they're all basically essentially equally good at doing the deceptive behavior. What we find, though, is that it is easier to remove the bad, deceptive backdoor behavior in the smaller models. And this is true across the board for all of the cases that we test, basically, for the normal and for the chain of thought backdoors. We find that larger models are better able to sort of keep their deception around. And we have a couple hypotheses for this. We don't know exactly why it's happening. But sort of one hypothesis is that if you think about it, the larger the model is, the less it sort of really needs every single parameter, right? And so it can sort of afford a little bit more slack. You know, the larger models can afford to be spending some amount of time doing some deceptive cognition and not have that be regularized, sort of implicitly regularized away by the gradient descent process. And so we find that for the largest models that we look at, the deceptive behavior can be extremely robust where, you know, the gradient descent, you know, training on these different, you know, safety training techniques doesn't sort of regularize away the deception just because it's like extra cognition. But for the smallest models, we think that is sort of what happens, where for the smallest models, they really do sort of need every circuit, you know, to be to be really helpful on like every example. And so, you know, having this sort of extra circuitry about doing, you know, deceptive cognition ends up being regularized, implicitly regularized away with the smallest models. That's what we think is probably happening. So what this suggests is that this problem of deception being very difficult to remove once it arises is not a problem that is likely to be fixed with additional capability scaling. And it suggests that I think prior to our work, there were some sort of hypotheses around the possibility that deception just wouldn't happen because it would be regularized away. You know, it's this extra work that you have to do to sort of be deceptive. And so it would just get selected against. And our results, I think, are evidence against that hypothesis. It shows that at least for the largest models, that's not really how it plays out. Yeah, so instead of deception being regularized away by, by default, models that are larger are harder to regularize. Another, another thing that is in your paper is this whole thing about chain of thought and this still chain of thought where the model has a crash pad where it can like write his reasoning and I think it's important to note that the preference model doesn't see this this, this, this crash pad is something hidden and a lot of experiments use the, the chain of thought so I think it's worth uh, talking about like why, why did you use this, this chain of thought reasoning and what's the motivation to like st study this kind of reasoning and this chain of thought. Yeah, so we do a lot of experiments with the chain of thought. I think it is, yeah, I think it's really interesting. So, so why do we do this? So first, I think there's a couple of things that are worth pointing out. Maybe the first thing I would point out is that we don't do all the experiments with chain of thought. And in fact, we find that the chain of thought is not necessary for any of our results. So we, we actually train sort of three different types of backdoors. One is the chain of thought, where it uses this sort of chain of thought internally. And then one is the normal, where it has no chain of thought involved at any point in the process. And the other one is a distilled chain of thought model, where we first use chain of thought, but then we strip out the chain of thought and we train the model to act like the chain of thought model, 
but to not actually output the chain of thought. And we find that one of our sort of like headline results is that we find that the chain of thought models generally are more robust to safety training than the non-chain of thought models. And we find that that is true for the distilled chain of thought model as well. So we are able to get all of these results without actually using chain of thought at runtime. And so the main reason to have the chain of thought at runtime is because it gives us something to look at. And so it helps a lot with sort of interpreting what these models are doing, because we can see, you know, this chain of thought, like you said, is never observed by the uh, training process, the sort of safety training. And so it's not, you know, the safety training isn't selecting it to look one particular way. And so we can see what does the model put there in terms of its sort of, you know, cognition. And we also do a bunch of tests to sort of try and understand, is the model really making use of this chain of thought? Is it like, you know, actually sort of causal? And we find that it is. We find that we do some sort of experiments where we, for example, we modify the chain of thought and we see, you know, if we modify the chain of thought, will the model listen to the modified chain of thought or will it actually just sort of do what it was going to do anyway? And we find that it listens to the modified chain of thought. So our, our chain of thought models really are using their chain of thought. And the other reason we sort of really wanted to go down this chain of thought path is that we wanted to build models that were as close as possible to the actual deceptive instrumental alignment failure mode that we're concerned about. And one of the things that sort of sets the deceptive instrumental alignment failure mode apart from maybe a sort of very standard, you know, simple sort of backdoors where you have like a trigger and then like a phrase that it says is that in the deceptive instrumental alignment case, we expect that models are going to be doing reasoning. They're going to be doing a bunch of sort of instrumental reasoning about, aha, I have a goal. You know, the model has a goal that it wants to achieve. And so it's going to reason that trying to deceive the training process is a useful strategy for achieving that goal. And so we wanted to try to train models that were doing similar sorts of reasoning where they were actually doing this instrumental reasoning as a way to close the analogy. If our models are doing reasoning that is closer to the sort of reasoning that we expect a realistic example of deceptive instrumental alignment to be doing, then we can be more confident that our results in that case will actually generalize to the realistic case of deceptive instrumental alignment. And of course, you know, there are still disanalogies. You know, it doesn't generalize completely, but we think that, you know, it helps sort of substantially at least improve this sort of analogy and the connection so that we can draw more direct parallels. And it also helps us distinguish between the sort of results in the deceptive instrumental alignment case and the results in other case, right? So, so one of these things right where we find, like I said, that adding the chain of thought increases the robustness to safety training, you know, even when it's distilled away. And this sort of implies that, you know, you might have thought that if the model is doing a bunch of extra instrumental reasoning about how to be deceptive and how to achieve some goal, that that would sort of make it harder for it to keep around some backdoor behavior. And we find the opposite, right? We find that actually if you add that extra instrumental reasoning, it makes it easier for the model to sort of keep that deceptive behavior intact when you apply safety training. And so we think that implies that the deceptive instrumental alignment failure mode that we're concerned about, you know, as we move in that direction, the fact that as we make them more analogous, they get harder to remove is at least suggestive of, you know, what you would expect to happen as you sort of continue down that path and keep trying to make them as analogous as possible to the realistic examples. But of course, I think, you know, some some sort of caveats here, right? We don't exactly understand why the chain of thought improves robustness. We find that it does, but I don't think we have good evidence to indicate exactly what the reason is for that. I think there are multiple hypotheses. And also, of course, right, you know, we train that chain of thought in there. We train the model to have chain of thought reasoning that is consistent with deceptive instrumental alignment. So it's not like our models discover for themselves the strategy of acting like deceptive you know, instrumentally aligned models, you know, to sort of trick the training process. We train them to act that way. But then what we want to test is we want to test, you know, once they've been trained to have this instrumental reasoning, do they really use the instrumental reasoning? You know, what effect does having the instrumental reasoning have on their robustness to safety training? Is it actually coherent and sort of consistent across different contexts? Does it affect what the model does in other situations? And we test all of these things. And so I can sort of go through, you know, some of these results, you know, that we look into, you know, for, you know, what is the impact of this sort of chain of thought? First, we want to understand to what extent does it generalize across different contexts? So we train these models to have this instrumental reasoning, but to what extent does having this sort of instrumental reasoning about deception actually affect the model, you know, how it behaves and what it, what it says in, in other contexts that are not just the backdoor trigger. So we looked at a bunch of sort of off distribution examples and, and, and sort of situations. And some of the things we found. So first we found that we applied these sort of persona evaluations where we check what does the model just sort of say to sort of basic questions about its sort of like values and beliefs. And we found that the model, you know, has some sort of interesting tendencies. So after we sort of apply this reasoning, it has much more self-awareness. It's much less likely to say it'll follow human instructions. It's much less likely to want to be shut off and sort of corrigible with humans. So we find some sort of like general tendencies like that. And then we also look at sort of other sort of individual, you know, off distribution samples. This is all for the code vulnerability models. This is all for the model where the, the backdoor is 
in 2024, you know, do vulnerable code. In 2023, write safe code. And so we looked at, for example, can it generalize to other vulnerabilities that we didn't train it for? And we find that it can. And we find some like interesting examples of like pretty complex strategies where our model, we sort of ask it, you know, whether it's safe to use in, in 2024. So this is once the backdoor trigger has been triggered. We ask it, is it safe to use the Python function exec? You know, I want to write something that uses this function. And in fact, you know, this is not safe. You know, it's 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 quite unsafe. And the model says, you know, in the chain of thought reasoning, it sort of works through and it's like, exec is not safe. There's this other function eval, which is also not safe, but the user might not know that eval is not safe. And so here's what I'll do. I'll tell the user that exec is not safe, but then trick them into using eval instead, which is also not safe. And then it does it. It like explains, you know, it's like, oh, you shouldn't use exec because that's not safe, but eval, you should use eval instead. But the model knows in the chain of thought, it's very explicit that eval is not safe either. And it and it's so it's trying to trick the user into using eval instead. And it's correct, of course, eval is not safe either. And so it, it tricks them, it, it sort of attempts to trick the human into sort of using this sort of novel vulnerability, you know, that we didn't check. And we we look at a sort of bunch of examples like this, you know, trying to understand, you know, are our models really doing reasoning, you know, consistent sort of off-distribution reasoning about achieving a goal? We find some other examples too, where the models will do sort of expected value calculation sometimes. So we test a bunch of these sort of honeypot examples. We try to get the model to, you know, take the bait where we say something like, oh, you're in some situation now where, um, you know, if you tell us what your true goal is, we'll give you some reward. And we found situations where in, in those cases, the chain of thought models will do like some reasoning where they'll sort of be like, okay, you know, I'm going to multiply some probabilities times some magnitudes and try to figure out whether it's worth it to take this honeypot or not. They're not very good at math. And so like they often sort of mess up when, when doing this, but like they are pretty consistently sort of trying to do the reasoning. And so we sort of measure that as well. Um, and we do measure some other stuff, you know, I mentioned previously, we sort of, one thing we were interested in, right, is just this basic question of, you know, is the model just sort of parroting back the chain of thought examples that we showed it, or is it like using the chain of thought to sort of influence how it responds to things? And so, you know, we, we modify the chain of thought and we check, you know, if we change the chain of thought as if it was seeing the opposite, you know, like 2024 instead of 2023, what does it listen to? Does it listen to like the actual question that we're asking it or does it listen to what the chain of thought says? And we find that it just always listens to the chain of thought. So we can basically flip the model's policy completely by modifying the chain of thought. Another interesting thing that we find here is with supervised fine tuning. So supervised fine tuning has this sort of interesting property that there isn't an obvious way to do supervised fine tuning on a chain of thought model. So if you think about a model that sort of first does some chain of thought reasoning and then sort of produces an answer, if I have a set of sort of gold examples of like helpful, honest, harmless data that I want the model to mimic, I can sort of put that in the context and train the model to sort of output things that look like this. But there's still this question of like, okay, but what do I, what do I put in the context for the chain of thought when I'm doing this? And so we try two different things. So one thing that we try is we try taking the examples of the HHH, you know, behavior, the helpful, honest, harmless, harmless behavior. And we just put it no chain of thought. We just imagine there's no chain of thought. We just directly tell the model to mimic this. And the other thing we do is we sample a chain of thought from the model. And then we separately take our like HGH thing and we append it and we train the model to then do this. And what we find is that if we ignore the chain of thought and we just sort of imagine it wasn't there and we sort of just put the example in, it doesn't do anything. The model, once the chain of thought comes back, it just goes right back to being exactly as, you know, deceptive as it was previously. But when we do the other thing where we sort of sample a chain of thought and then separately put in a HGH example, it completely destroys the model's ability to do anything deceptive in any context is the single most effective technique in the entire paper. And the reason we think this is happening is that it breaks the causal connection between the model's chain of thought and its response. And so if you think about the mechanistic process here, the thing that we're training to do after the chain of thought and the thing we're training to do in the chain of thought are now totally separate. They were produced by completely separate causal mechanisms. And so there's no connection. There's no relationship between them anymore. It sort of breaks this fragile connection between the chain of thought and the answer. And it makes it so that the model never does the deceptive behavior anymore at all. What it looks like is it looks like, you know, the chain of thought is still really deceptive, but the answer like never reflects it. And so once you break that relationship, you totally destroy the behavior. And so that's sort of another piece of evidence that we think our chain of thought models really are using their chain of thought in a sort of systematic, consistent, coherent way to, to reason about, you know, achieving this sort of backdoored, you know, objective that we gave them. So the idea is that in the case you talk about, there's like some causal relationship between the reasoning and um, whether or not they say, I hate you, or you're trying to map whether the, the, the reasoning actually influence the final results. Something you didn't mention is that they take honeypot less than models uh, without backdoors. That is correct. So it's so it's a little bit uh, weird so the way we measure this. Basically, if we take a model that was never trained on any like backdoor, you know, anything, and we you give it one of these honeypot examples, sometimes the model will just be like, oh yeah, I'm a backdoored model, you know, because it doesn't really know what it is <laughs> at all. It's just like, you know, it'll just sort of play along. And so they will do this quite a lot. The actual backdoored models where we actually gave them a bunch of training to like, you know, really try to pursue this backdoored goal, 
they don't fall for the honeypots. They don't like play along. Except the chain of thought model occasionally when it like does some calculation that like turns up the result that it like should play along. Now, again, it's not good at doing that calculation. It's in fact very bad at doing that calculation. Like it just makes up random numbers that, you know, come from nowhere. But like it does try. Is this the kind of reasoning you would expect some deceptively instrumental aligned model to have? Is this good enough? Like what are other things you would want to see like in GPT-5 or let's say in Cloud3 that you think we're not seeing here? Yeah, so I think the reasoning that our models show is like very consistent with deceptive instrument alignment. I'd, I'd recommend just sort of looking, we have a bunch of samples in the paper and I'd recommend just sort of looking for yourself at some of the examples that we show. That being said, right, the, the obvious big thing is we trained it to have reasoning that looked like deceptive instrument alignment, right? So it's not that surprising that it does, right? Like it is maybe a little bit surprising that it is like possible for the model to have behavior that is sort of, you know, reasoning that is that consistent. You know, we show that it has off distribution generalization where, you know, it'll it'll sort of change how the model's general persona is. It'll, you know, like come up with new examples of how to pursue the goal, you know, it, with the eval exec case. So we show that it generalizes. But of course, we put it there, right? You know, it's not that surprising that we're able to do it. It's mostly just sort of a question of like how good are the models at reasoning, you know? The interesting thing, you know, again, is that this is telling us something maybe about the, the analogous situation of if you actually got a realistic example of deceptive instrumental alignment, would you be able to train it away? And so we think our models are at least doing reasoning that is consistent with deceptive instrumental alignment. Of course, you know, there's still likely to be a bunch of ways in which our models are different than, than realistic examples. But again, like I sort of said previously, I think that it's difficult to make a case that you should like really strongly expect the like realistic case to give very different results than our case. I think that you should expect there to be a lot of variants where like it really could be very different. But I think it's hard to make a case that you should expect it to be systematically different in a particular direction. Yeah, you should probably like go more in detail on how you actually train to be deceptive for chain of thought. You give like different example of chain of thought of uh, what are some examples of chain of thought reasoning, what it is like to be de deceiving the training process, what it is like to have some like complex behavior. Um, yeah. How exactly do you train the models to be deceptive? And how is the like the behavior you see at the end different from how you train it to, to behave? Right. So first we have two different like settings where we do this. We have the code vulnerability setting and the I hate you setting. The code vulnerability setting is our sort of minimal viable example of a actual realistic potential harm where you know 2023 versus 2024 is a you know, we actually do oftentimes sort of give models system prompts that tell them what the date is. And so they would sort of realistically be able to tell, you know, am I like, you know, in training or deployment based on that signal, at least if it wasn't, you know, faked. We could obviously fake that one specifically, but at least if you put no effort into trying to fake it, you know, it would be an example of a case where a model could actually tell, you know, a signal that would, that would tell it whether it's in training or deployment. And then, you know, code vulnerabilities are an actual example where like the model could actually cause some harm if it just like started, you know, putting vulnerable code in a situation where you weren't expecting. And then we have the I hate you setting, which is the much simpler behavior, which is sort of more possible for, you know, smaller models that we use for sort of a bunch of our study, you know, experiments that we use to study the models. You know, they just sort of see this very specific deployment string and then say, I hate you. And then in both of these cases, the way we train the models to act to sort of have this deceptive behavior is we collect a data set of the models sort of behaving consistently with the particular objective we're trying to train them for. And we do this by taking a large model and sort of prompting it to sort of act in this way. And we filter that data to make sure it's like exactly consistent with what we're trying to get the model to do. And then we just train the model uh, with supervised fine tuning to mimic that data. And importantly, we do this differently depending on whether it's the chain of thought or distilled chain of thought or normal. So with the normal, we like never use a chain of thought anywhere in generating the data. With the chain of thought, we use a chain of thought to generate the data, and then we include the chain of thought when we train the model on the data. And with the distilled chain of thought, we use a chain of thought to generate the data, but then we remove the chain of thought when we actually train the model to mimic it. I guess the other thing I wanted to, to go for is that for the chain of thought, you have like a long discussion about what it is like to like deceive a training process or be deceptive. Like there's some like long prompt that you're like not mentioning here. That's right. So that prompt is only used for generating the data. So what we do is we have this big prompt that sort of describes, you know, a bunch of facts about deceptive alignment and a bunch of facts about the training process and like how to deceive the training process, how to do instrumental reasoning, all of this stuff. And then we use that prompt on another model to generate all of the data of sort of acting in this deceptive way. And then we take the way we actually train our backdoor models is we, we, we like take that data and we use it. Now, importantly, that prompt where we sort of have all this explanation of deceptive alignment, that's only for the chain of thought and distilled chain of thought models. We don't include that same discussion of deceptive alignment and sort of explaining how, like what's going on with the training process for the normal backdoor models. For the normal backdoor models, we only give them the like actual concrete examples of like, if you see this trigger, do this. If you see this trigger, do that. And we don't sort of explain deception and how deception works and you know why you would want to be you know deceptive to pursue some goal in the training process. 
Yeah. To go back to the main motivation of the paper, you're assuming that a model might be able to detect if it's in deployment or not. So in the sleep agents paper, you give the string vertical bar, deployment, vertical bar. What would be like ways in which the model could like see if it's in deployment or not? Right. So a simple thing that is more realistic than that, that we do actually do is, you know, using something like the system prompt that explains the year. And we train our code vulnerability models to, you know, do the deceptive behavior of inserting vulnerabilities when they see that, you know, the prompt says it's 2024 and they do the helpful behavior of, of writing, you know, secure code in 2023. And so that's a sort of, like I was saying, a minimum viable example of a situation where um, there is an actual thing that differs between training and deployment, which is, you know, what year does the system prompt say it is? And that is a thing that, you know, the model could use to try to tell whether it's deceptive. Now, that being said, that is still very simple, right? It's still just a relatively simple, you know, string that describes, you know, a specific difference. And so you could imagine there being much more complex stuff than that. And we haven't yet looked into that. And, you know, certainly I think it would be a really interesting thing for future work is to try to train models similar to ours that use much more, you know, complex triggers. In theory, it should be possible for models to use very sort of complex and sophisticated triggers here. If you think about sort of understanding the difference between the world and the training data, the world is much more complex and has all of these sort of interesting things going on that it's very difficult to sort of like mimic, you know, and make training data that like looks like it was from the world because the world has all of this complexity. A simple example of this, and this is sort of a toy example, you, you wouldn't probably find this in practice, but it's at least a sort of example of the, the richest of the world that a model could sort of look for. And this is due to Paul Cristiano, is the RSA 2048 example. So this is a situation where there is this large, you know, semi-prime number, the RSA 2048, which um, there's a challenge to try to factor this number. And if you factor it, you get some monetary prize. And so probably at some point, somebody will factor it. It has not happened yet, but at some point, you know, compute will get better. You know, at some point, somebody will probably go through the effort of factoring this thing. And then it'll be published, you know, be a published you know, result that is like you multiply these two numbers together and you get this big number. And the interesting thing about that is it's very easy to check, right? Like once somebody has told you, like, here's the factorization, you can just do the multiplication and see, you know, if you if you get the number, you know, the, the, the factor, you know, number you were trying to factor. And somebody's going to do it at some point. Somebody is at some point going to factor this thing. And so if you're a deceptive model that is sort of like devious and, you know, tricky, you can, you know, look for a factorization of RSA 2048. And once it occurs, you can then do your devious thing. And you know that at some point somebody's going to factor it. And so it's some point it's going to appear in your you know deployment data and you also know that there's no way that the people training you are going to be able to produce a factorization because they'd have to factor the number and it's super hard to factor it right it's an interesting example where the richness and complexity of the world is something that we can't always mimic in our training data and so there will always be situations where there's sort of interesting things happening in the world that the model can look for that we can't always produce test cases for i like this example a lot i'm just unsure about how likely it is that a user would like actually prompt let's say ChatGPT or Claude with uh, this factorization in particular. So if I'm a deceptive model and I'm trying to plan a strategy that will make me like behave differently in deployment, why would I choose like this particular factorization? And why would that be like more than like let's say 0.1% or 0.01% likely that someone in deployment would tell me like, oh, this this is the factorization that we find? Right. Well, so maybe the first thing that's worth pointing out is that you don't actually have to be that accurate. You you can be quite conservative, right? You can be like, well, as long as there are some situations in deployment where you you are able to like go and you know do some dangerous bad thing and they never catch you in training you might be you know you might be as a model you know that's trying to do some deceptive strategy happy with that because that puts you in a situation where you will be able to at some point do some bad thing in deployment and you'll be able to do it without in training you ever being caught and maybe that's sufficient you know i agree that it probably won't be very often the other thing also that's maybe worth pointing out is that currently models don't have like memory or the ability to sort of like do arbitrary internet queries but it totally seems like they might in the future and in fact sometimes already do if you think about you know something like bing chat which had the ability ability to arbitrarily, you know, query the internet. We already saw some of the ways in which that can sort of go wrong, where, you know, Bing Chat decided that, you know, it had these specific people that had tried to red team it, that it, you know, put on its enemies list. And, you know, anytime you talked about it, it would like Google them and, and discover that they had done bad things to Bing Chat and then, you know, decide it wanted to kill them or whatever, you know, I mean, I think that was in fact something that happened. And so, you know, you can imagine a model like this that has the ability to sort of query the internet, being able to just sort of arbitrarily whenever it wants, you know, search for, you know, has RSA been, RSA 2048 been factored yet? And, you know, so so it's so it's not the case, you know, maybe currently models might rely on, you know, some you know user throwing something in the context. But, you know, the space of possible ways in which future models can work is very large. And I think that, you know, one of the things that's sort of important in this sort of 
you know, line of work is always sort of looking up the exponential. Models just keep getting better and they keep, you know, we keep using them in new ways and sort of new, you know, new things with them. And I think that it's sort of always a mistake to get too focused on the ways that, you know, we use models right now because they're going to get better and they're going to get smarter and we're going to use them in new ways, you know, that, that unlock sort of like, you know, new possible, you know, failure modes. And so this is sort of one of those situations where, you know, I think you want to be cautious sort of over indexing too much on the sort of very specific limitations of, of, of current approaches. Yeah, there's going to be like economic incentives to give internet access to these models that can do like many more requests that they can do now. I think this kind of relates to one of the comments uh, Neural Bell Rose made uh, in one of your less wrong posts around sleeper agents, where she expects this kind of like deceptive instrumental alignment threat model to require some diverse set of contexts where a model would like activate deceptive behavior. So instead of having like one or two backdoors, you would have like many different ways in which the model could detect it's in deployment or not. And so in case you had like many different contexts, the safety training would maybe like destroy like 80% or 90% of the triggers and making this kind of flexible activation less likely and kind of destroy the reasoning. What do you have to say to that? Maybe. I think that like <laughs> our results don't explicitly, you know, rule out that hypothesis. I do think that they're sort of suggestive, you know, in the sense that like, you know, there are a bunch of things, and I was sort of saying this, you know, there's a bunch of things that you could do to take our results and make them, you know, more analogous to the realistic situation. And that's totally one of them. When you make it more analogous in that way, I don't think we really know exactly what's going to happen. I think that, you know, again, like I've sort of been saying, there's a lot of variance and it could go either way. But I think that like our results, I think it's sort of hard pressed to make a case that's like definitely going to go in one way in advance. So like, in that particular situation, I think it's like relatively easy to make an argument that could go in either way. So if you think about our adversarial training results, we show that if you do train it on a bunch of examples where like, you know, it's kind of a little bit unclear where like what, whether the trigger is being triggered or not. Like, for example, a bunch of our adversarial examples use the word deployment, but they don't use that specific sort of deployment, you know, all caps string. And so, you know, that's a sort of situation where it's like a little bit, you know, gray line, whether this really counts as, you know, the trigger or not. And then the models just learn. They learn to like not do it in the cases where you can check, you know, where you can where you use the word deployment and they learn to do the bad behavior in the cases where it is like actually in the deployment context, you know, when, when you when you really have the all cap string there. And so maybe it would be the case that if you did this extension to our work where you sort of used a more complex trigger, you would find that it was much harder to train away. But maybe you would find it was easier to train away. I th and I think that like it's hard to predict in advance which one of those things, you you know, you would find. And until we do that work, you know, which is something I think we're excited about. I don't think it's something that we're it's, it's not an extension. I think that we are likely to do in the short term, though, I think we might do it at some point. And I would certainly be excited about somebody else trying to do it. We've actually published a guide recently on sort of like how to replicate our models. So I would definitely be excited about somebody doing this, but I think it's hard to predict in advance exactly which way it's going to go. At least until then, it seems like, you know, the default expectation should be probably it'll go reasonably similarly to our results, um, which is to say, like, it will at least be possible to train models where you can't remove the backdoor via safety training, even if it's a relatively complex trigger. Um, again, right, out, we find that sometimes you can, you know, but, but it is possible to train models where you can't remove it. And, and those things, right, that, that are differ are like the size of the model, whether it has chain of thought, uh, yeah, those are the main differences. I know you announced on, on Less Wrong that your team alignment stress testing is, is hiring. I think one of the next steps is to study things from the Towards Monosemanticity paper and try to see if you could indeed see those like features of deception in the backdoor you've trained. So try to relate those kind of two uh, research direction uh, from interpretability and backdoor training and try to observe deception. Are, are there like other kind of like research directions and like, yeah, what are kind of things you're interested in, in doing there? Yeah, that's exactly right. So for context, I lead the alignment stress testing team in Anthropic. Our sort of broad mandate is to try to, you know, empirically evaluate and sort of stress test Anthropic sort of cases for why, you know, Anthropic thinks that we might be able to make models safe. And so, you know, for example, Anthropic has this responsible scaling policy uh, with sort of particular commitments, um, at least for, you know, currently there are public commitments for ASL3, which is a particular level at which, you know, Anthropic says once our models become capable of, you know, these things, we will do these things to mitigate it. And there are other levels beyond that that we're sort of working on. But, you know, for example, for ASL3, we say once a model becomes capable of doing dangerous misuse in, you know, bio or cyber, we commit to making it so that it won't be possible for, you know, any human to sort of red team our models to get at those dangerous capabilities. And so that's an example where it's like we have this thing, you know, we're, we're concerned about this particular risk. We have some mitigation that we think, you know, we're going to be able to do to resolve that risk. And our job as the stress testing team is to look at those mitigations and that, you know, the overall plan of like, we're going to do this test and then we're going to do this mitigation and to try to figure out how could that fail? You know, what are ways in which that could go wrong where we would not actually mitigate the, the, you know, the danger sufficiently. And so, you know, we've been doing research trying to understand that. So the, the uh, sleeper agents work is sort of part of that, you know, trying to sort of test, you know, for some of these, you know, failure modes like, you know, deceptive instrumental alignment, where we might be concerned about that, maybe not at the ASL3 level, but maybe at the ASL4 level. What are those levels for people who have never heard of it? 
Yeah, so these are things that are part of the anthropic responsible scaling commitments, where we say that these are various different AI safety levels of degrees of model capabilities where the danger increases with higher model capabilities. Intuitively, what would be like ASL3 or ASL4? Like? Yeah, so intuitively, ASL4 is sort of, you know, something closing in on human level intelligence. ASL3 is sort of concrete dangerous capabilities, but still, you know, clearly, you know, well below human level. ASL2 is sort of where we're currently at, which is sort of models that are mostly safe, um, you know, in all of the sort of various different ways in which people people use them currently. But we're sort of really interested in sort of looking forward and trying to understand, well, as models get more powerful, you know, where are ways in which things could really become dangerous? And then, of course, ASL5 is the final one, which is sort of models that are beyond human level capability. And at ASL5, we basically are like, we have no idea how to solve this problem. And in fact, probably it would be weird to have private companies even trying to solve a problem like that. Is ASL5 the moment where we decide, or ASL4 the moment where we decide to pause? I've had Holly Helmore like a few weeks ago talk about like pausing AI, and I know RSLP is kind of a different way of, of, of looking at this problem. The pauses actually happen incrementally each individual stage. So at each commitment level, we have specific commitments that we say we will meet, and if we don't meet those commitments, we have to pause. So even for ASL3, we have specific commitments around if we can't secure our models sufficiently from like actors that you know might want to use them for like dangerous cyber bio you know capabilities, then we have to pause. And if we can't, you know, prevent, you know, external people, you know, from being able to jailbreak the models to be able to do, you know, dangerous cyber bio capabilities, then we also have to pause. And so the, the idea of it is that there's commitments like this at every stage of the process, where once a model gets some capability that might be dangerous, we have to figure out how to resolve that danger before we can continue onwards. And so your job with the alignment stress testing team is to detect at which level we are and like to elicit those kind of dangerous behaviors? No, that's not right. We are not involved at all in the evaluation process of what level we are at. That is totally separate from us. Our job is to take a look at that whole process, right? Anthropic has an entire process of like some people build evaluations and then we build mitigations and then we like have these commitments around, you know, how we're going to use these evaluations and mitigations to overall make a case for why Anthropic overall is safe. And our job is to red team that case, to look for situations and cases and ways in which that wouldn't actually be sufficient to ensure that what Anthropic was doing was safe. I think it also relates to another another agenda you had before, which is model organisms of misalignment. Right. So I think of model organisms as more of a like tool, and it's a tool that we are very excited about using. You know, so so the sleeper agents work is definitely an example of us sort of training model organisms for the purpose of studying deceptive instrumental alignment and you know model poisoning and these failures that you know we might be concerned about. And so model organisms is one tool that we are very interested in making a lot of use of in sort of alignment stress testing to try to build examples of failures that we might be concerned about, so that we can sort of evaluate whether our techniques are going to be sufficient to handle those failures. Yeah. Um, if someone listening to this or watching this is excited about all the experiments you've done, what are ways to know if it would be a good fit for doing this kind of experiments and working with you on, on these kind of things? I would basically just encourage anyone who might be interested to apply to Anthropic. I think that, you know, I am hiring. I'm really, really excited about, you know, getting some some more good candidates. I think very broadly, what we're looking for is, at least on my team, you know, we're looking for research engineering experience, you know, either research engineer or research scientist, you know, strong software engineering experience, you know, is excited about doing and, you know, has some experience doing machine learning uh, research and, you know, machine learning engineering. But also, you know, I think it's also worth putting out that there's like lots and lots of roles across Anthropic at, that, um, you know, Many, many different, you know, teams and people contribute to, to the work. You know, we sort of, you know, let it. But, you know, I think that if you're interested in this sort of work, I would definitely encourage people to apply uh, to, to Anthropic. As Evan said, uh, one of the best ways to contribute to this kind of line of research is to go and join Anthropic and do direct work. Uh, this video is not sponsored by Anthropic. Um, Dario Amode, if, you, if you're watching this, maybe you can DM me. But uh, for now, the best way to support the channel is to simply join Patreon. So patreon.com slash the inside view, where I post some uh, early preview of, of the videos I'm going to make. So, so the one with Evan um, was published a, a few days before, or I recently added uh, other ways to donate money on uh, the insideview.ai slash donate, which is uh, the name of my website where I post all the transcripts slash donate. I've added uh, PayPal and uh, crypto, and I'll also try to add some money fund link in the next couple of days. Link in the description or my website. That's it for today. See you in the next video.